11. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 11 Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tack, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbait, 10% off Contactin Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, weekly giveaways, and of course, private membership only content. We are only 11 members away from the next major milestone. For more information, check out the link in the episode description. Head on over to our Patreon. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we're finally heading back down south to the the outer edge of of the DMV area because, again, why is North Carolina part of the DMV area? Because people that live in Virginia are crazy. We have to commute everywhere to God's earth because the Shenandoah Division, which is technically the most Virginia BFL division, has us going down to Kerr, which is a hell of a drive. And really, High Rock and, and Norman are kind of in that same conglomerate for some reason. So... I really wanted to bring on a guy who knows about Kerr, High Rock, and Norman. And I have on Travis Donaldson, who came in second last year on High Rock for the BFL, and he also smoked him on Kerr. So this guy knows how to catch him down there. Travis, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. This is uh, great to be back on the show. Dude, you absolutely are getting it done down there. And these reservoirs, it's hardcore to be successful down there because of how much fishing pressure there is. Oh yeah, ton, ton of fishing pressure, Tur- uh, a ton of tournaments, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, so uh, the fish have gotten very finicky over the last couple of years. And and honestly, before we get into like you know the uh, kind of like just a, a broad overview of a high rock fishing report and and like Norman Kerr Reservoir, you have a love hate relationship with it because you have done well there in the past. What what were your thoughts going into this uh, this latest tournament? Yeah, so this past weekend, um, I really didn't know what to expect. I haven't been on Kerr. Um, well, I'll take that back. I did go up and I fished Kerr. I think it was the end of February. Um, it was for the uh, ABA Pro League division, but it was not the North Carolina. It was the their um, Virginia division. And we had the, the awful weather that weekend. I think they had the BFL on Smith Mountain Lake that same weekend. And it was awful. Torrential downpours all day. Wind was blowing 35 miles an hour. Um, uh, and I, I, I'd caught some fish. I, I mean, uh, I kind of went for the wind in that tournament. I had uh, maybe close to 13 pounds of fish. And I had found some fish in a shallow pocket. And I'd caught a five-pounder in there um, during practice. So pretty much I had four hours to fish. And I went in there and I just stuck it all day flipping a jig and trying to catch a big one for the wind. And uh, you know, didn't get it or whatnot. It was a miserable day, but uh, um, that's that's the only tournament I've been up and uh, fished her um, this year. Um, so going up this past weekend, I I don't know. I had some expectations that those fish that I was catching were, were definitely maybe some post spawn fish or uh, pre spawn fish, and um, I wanted to just check some of those areas and um maybe feed off that thinking maybe the fish are more moved to the bank and i could find some fish on the bank maybe some fish on you know on bed um but kind of weird uh um didn't didn't work out kind of as planned uh i I could catch uh, a lot of small fish and i had nine or ten pounds of fish i knew i could catch um peg but like finding those three and four pound fish was it was really difficult for me and the way i like the fish I, i think some guys were catching them off the bank maybe um dragging some points or cranking points or doing something like that but it's april (laughs) i gotta go to the bank in april you know it's such an interesting place because if you say on the james river or the potomac or smith oh i have to find a three and a half pounder or a four pounder people would look at you cross-eyed like okay what how's that a problem just go over here but kerr it is you are literally looking for maybe two that are in that four to five pound class that significantly bumps you up Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, a two four pounders would have went a very long ways for me um, this tournament this past weekend. Um, but uh, it's just finding them, and you know, Kerr being a you know substantially fairly good sized lake, you know, um, in two days of practice, you kind of got to land on them or or know the lake fairly well, um, you know, to get around those fish. Um, I guess I, you know, in a way, last year I, it was kind of a unicorn that I pulled in a couple pockets and just landed on you know, two, two pockets that were just loaded with four pound fish, you know, and that was, you know, I dropped almost 20 pounds last year, 1970 something, you know, had a, had a really good tournament, but didn't quite work out this weekend. We had a lot of fun and, you know, and caught some bass. Um, the turnout was down a bit. It seems like on the BFLs, uh, I think it was 70, 74 boats, maybe. Um, so it was down a little bit. I'm not fishing that division this year. Just kind of went up. Uh, um, a friend of mine, Mr. Dale Surrett, he's, he's co-angling in the Piedmont and in the North Carolina BFL. So um, just wanted to get up there and kind of jump in and, um, you know, give Kerr a run. But 13 pounds, know. five ounces. 13 pounds, five ounces got you in the top 10. But then yep. really to crack a top five or even to win it, you needed 15 to 17 pounds, which – I don't know why that there's something about that place is just it's interesting because it is truly harder to find that caliber of fish. It's not just there for the picking where winning and like so I think like Lake Champlain. I heard this about Lake Champlain. The problem with Lake Champlain is it's a game of ounces. Like you need to find a three pound point two ounce smallmouth to be able to win mm -hmm. there because there's a bunch of three point there's three point oh's. Kerr, it's like no, you need to find literally a different caliber of fish to have exactly. a chance. And that really, I think, messes with your mindset if you've never been there before. Because I've had friends that gone down there before, like, oh, this is the greatest like ever. You catch them everywhere. It's like you catch fish, but they're not the winning caliber. And if you're not used to that mentally, it does mess with you when you go down there the first time. It really does. I, and I think you, that's why you see a lot of the Lake Norman, North Carolina guys that do well at Kirk because Lake Norman fishes the same way. You can catch, you can go to Norman and you can catch 20. 30, 40, 50 spots, but finding some of the bigger spots or some of those four pound largemouth, it can be a challenge. But once you find them in a certain area, then it tends, you tend to stick it out in that area and uh, do the same thing and you'll start catching those caliber of fish. But finding them is, is what will spin you out, especially in a tournament or just even in practice in general. You know, you're just out there grinding, grinding, and it's, you know, keeper, keeper, two pounder, two pounder, two pounder. And, you know, knowing that, that, you know, you just need a couple four pounders to really do well. Do you ever venture up into the river at all? Because I've always been curious if people ever run into the Roanoke River or the Stanton. Yeah, so I almost. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because I ran back to Nutbush and I caught a two and a half pounder. And that's what really gave me my 12 pounds of fish. But I almost, I didn't do it in practice, but I was going to go to Bluestone. Um, and really i've never ventured past bluestone catching green fish now striper that when i was heavy into striper fishing yes we'd run right up into the rolling oak uh stanton um you know it gets a little hairy up there it gets a little rocky as you get on up but in april um i know we used to catch a lot of green fish throwing bucktails and flukes catching striper um this particular tournament, I almost had a wild hair to at least go up into the Bluestone area just to check. I like the water. The watercolor was a little more dirty. Um, and uh, I did get a couple spinnerbait bites and, um, you know, some jig bites. And that was one reason during the tournament I left Nutbush and I did run the grassy. And I did make a call at grassy um, fishing the jig. Or I actually called it that one on a crankbait. But, uh, um I did like the watercolor. I just never made that move. I, I was so confident in the fish I was around in Nutbush. I thought I could maybe get down there, get lucky, maybe catch 13 and a half, 14 pounds. But, uh, you know, it didn't work out. But I think the river can be good to you this time of year. Is it off limits at all? Like, how far can you run the lake? Is the whole lake on limits or off limits? Or how does that work? Well, I, well, the way the BFL, the rules for state, is, you know, as long as it says, you know, no fishing um, and right there around the ramp that, you know, there at um, 
um, at Nutbush where we put in, um, you, I mean, pretty much, I think you could run as far as you got the balls to go, <laughs> you know, uh, cause once you get up that river, you know, it gets a little hairy, you know, the lower unit can be jeopardized. Yeah. And I've, and the reason I, I kind of set that up is first, I didn't know, but when you look at this individual called Octafo and when he used to go to these certain lakes in Tennessee and he would get pimped yeah. out boats because he knew the fishing would be tough on like a Douglas or a Cherokee and you could win with a, with a pimped out boat going up, up river. And then I, before this interview looked at old curve tournaments and it doesn't seem like a lot of people have ever tried to do that. Now I could be like letting the cat out of the bag right now, or that, that population doesn't exist up there, but it looks like Kerr would set up just like a Tennessee Lake for that. Yes. I, I, like I said, I've personally, I've never done it. And I, I have catching striper a lot. They're chasing all that bait fish up those rivers to spawn um, you know, second, third, fourth week of April. So, um, mm. it, you know, it could be a plan. It could be something that some guys do that I just don't know about. But interesting. Um, it, it, I, I think it could definitely be a player if you know how to run, you know, run it in your boat. So, changing topics from a lake that doesn't have a lot of big fish to a lake that might only have big fish, <laughs> High Rock <laughs> Lake. Um, if you had to describe this to a person that's never been there before and just wants to kind of get a vibe for it. What is High Rock Lake like? Is it how big is it? What are you looking at? Is it all vegetation or is it docks? Like a high level review of it. Okay. Um, high Rock Lake, uh, s- smaller lake. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact acreage on it. I want to say like 32,000, maybe. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on it. It's, it's probably close. It's, um, um, it's a river system. Catawba River runs in um, up. When you're in the river, I do love fishing the river. There's a lot of bushes, a lot of sandbars. Um, uh, the that part of the river that on the Yak and Chain is just covered with sand. Uh, a lot of sand. Um, uh, usually a dirty water lake. Most of the time, the water you're not going to see it clear. You're not going to look down four feet. Um, visibility, you know, on a good day on high rock, you're probably a foot maybe two foot of water um wow especially yeah up the river so it's a it's a it's a dirty water lake um like i said it could be a really fun like it sets up a little like curve when the water's up and it is the first lake on the chain on the yakin river it's the first lake on the chain um Hmm. so they do keep the lake a lot of times around two foot low if it starts getting up the full pond it's hard to get under the bridges and if you can't get under the bridges like at flat swamp or um abbott's creek the fish the fishing does become really small especially in a tournament um because that pretty much cuts off cuts the lake in half um the flat swamp and abbott's creek are one of the two the two main creeks that run into the river uh, into the lake that is major because I went down there for fun last year because my friends were fishing the BFL and I just go down for fun and I have 10 foot power poles and I didn't freaking know that at yeah. first until I got close and I got off pad. Cause I was like, this looks really hairy. If yeah. you've never been to this lake before, be insanely careful uh, depending on those water levels because it's, it's a tight squeeze. It really is. Yeah. It, it, it can actually be bad. I fished a team tournament uh, with my partner Lee um, when I first got my Skeeter boat in 2022, I hadn't had six months and we had got on some fish in Abbott's Creek and I, I didn't pay attention to the, I mean, I did. I, you always want to look at the water level. You, um, Cube Carolinas, uh, and they regulate the water there for Duke Energy and whatnot. That's the website you want to go to. Um, and you want to see, it'll show you the fluctuation forecast and you know, you need to be mindful of that. That day uh, we had practiced uh, on Friday. We had found some fish in Abbott. Uh, we thought we had a chance at a, a solid 20 plus pound bag. Um, we go up underneath Abbott's Creek Bridge that morning. The fluctuation forecast was saying stable. And uh, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> we, we got, we fished. I think we had around 18, 19 pounds. Uh, Tournament's coming to an end. We come back. We're going underneath the Abbott's Creek Bridge. And, of course, it's a set of railroad tracks and then then the road itself, the road bridge itself. As we're getting under the railroad tracks, it's so tight. Um, I, I couldn't. I got I got my rafters down. 
We're going under this bridge. Lee's on his belly. I'm like, just try to, you know, there's way more boats and stuff coming. This is in June, of course, like first week of June. So we've got weights because the weight more boats love on the Abbott Street side to run and just do like laps down there next to the bridge. Uh, my my front graph ends up smashing the uh, the uh, the railroad trussle where those big bolts come down. Smash! Uh, it, luckily, it didn't bust my graph, but it busted the back half of it. It busted the top of my trolling motor. We got in between the railroad trussle and the bridge, and we were both just. I guess we're stuck here because there's no way we're getting underneath this road bridge. And uh, we seen our opportunity and we tried to just go back into Abbott's. And as we did, my cow went on my brand new Yamaha, smacks a bolt and knocks a chunk out of it. But we get back into Abbott's Creek and uh, Lee ends up getting out onto the rip rap, crosses the road. There just happened to be a guy that was in this tournament fishing on the rip rap. And um, by then the guy, he said, I don't have anything. And, um, Lee was, he was like, well, maybe, you know, call the tournament director, you grab the fish, run them across the road or whatever, you weigh them in our boat. By then, we just run out of time. I was kind of up to here and just done with it, with the damage that was done to my brand new boat, you know. So, uh, that guy ended up running Lee back to, uh, at that time, we could do tournaments out of, uh, uh, Dutchman's Creek at, um, Tamarack Marina, which since then, Tamarack's been balled out and they don't, I don't know if, they just don't like bass fishermen or what, but we're not doing tournaments there anymore. So we are, everything goes out of South Ma. But uh, he had to take Lee back, get my truck and trailer and go meet me at the ramp in Abbott's, which, you know, is an hour and a half drive on the other side of the lake. So, but yeah, so really be mindful, you know, if you've never been to High Rock or it's first time fishing, just be mindful of the water levels. Um, it, it's nice to see, um, you know, you're, Two foot, at least two foot low before going on the bridges. Uh, you know, if you start getting at that 1.5, it's starting to get pretty hairy, you know. So just be mindful of that because you can get stuck and it can make for a bad day. Oh, dude, that freaking blows, man. <laughs> oh, but you'll never do that again. <laughs> Good no, Lord. no, no. Well, so speaking of that kind of leads up into the ABA pro league, uh, on high rock there a couple of weeks back. Um, we had a lot of rain and I told myself, I'm not going under the bridges. <laughs> and, and during practice, I did go under the flat swamp bridge. Uh, and it was so tight and, um, there was some bed and fish in an area, but, um, they wasn't big enough. I felt like I, the, the size of fish that I was wanting, you know, need to catch to, to have a shot at winning the tournament. So I focused all everything I had on main lake and river and just to stay out of Abbott's and flat swamp. And, uh, just, you know, like I said, never do that again. So, um, that made it tough on me because I have a lot of good spots in flat swamp and Abbott's, um, that Creek holds a lot of fish and I swear it's almost like Abbott's has gotten better since all the tournaments for the last year and a half or better. It's been going out of Southmont since they shut Tamarack down because the Southmont boat ramps are right there at Abbott's Creek. Um, I don't know if hmm. the fish just more of them are swimming up in Abbott's Creek or what, but there's a lot of big bags coming out of that Creek. Um, is that, I, and this, I, I, I focus mainly in the, in, you know, in the, in the main section of the lake. And, and and so this kind of just tees up my next kind of question for you is like w when you had your success finishing second last year on the BFL at High Rock, was that really in that, that area you just described like the Abbott's area? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much. Yeah. My second place finish last year in the BFL. Um, I caught, I caught my majority of my fish. I caught 17, 17 pounds out of uh, Abbott's when I left. And uh, then I finished it up in flat swamp where I almost, you know, I had a little over 20. So you've had the history in these areas, but I guess from a game plan mentality, are you trying to teach yourself to fish other areas of the lake? So just in case it is a high water place, you're not screwed. Exactly. Exactly. That was my whole game plan uh, for this past, this past ABA tournament on high rock. That was my whole plan. I did not want to get in another situation where I got a big bag of fish and I can't get back under the bridge. So I, I, I made myself practice main lake, um, I, and, uh, and I didn't find a lot of fish. Uh, I, I really didn't. Um, um, I had an area down the lake. I had one little pocket off the main lake uh, that I found some fish that morning, and uh, there, 
they were up shallow. They were, you know, getting ready to do the thing, pulling up on their beds. Uh, I had another pocket going back up for the river. There's just another little small pocket up in the map. I pulled in. I actually seen two on the bed. They were locked. And um, did I lose you? I can still hear you. Oh, there okay. You um, but yeah, I had two. I had two locked on the bed. I'm horrible for judging fish on the bed. I thought they were two pounders. So I just knew they were there. I left them. I thought one was probably in between two and three pounds. I left them and went fishing. I kind of went up the river. I went into Crane Creek, which is another main creek that I kind of left out. It's up the river more on your left hand side running up. And then you got Swearing Creek, which is a smaller creek going up. Um, and I went into Crane and I had another pocket that I seen some fish up kind of cruising, but they look, acted like they were kind of in that pocket stuck, like they were getting ready. Maybe they're thinking about doing the thing. So I had that in the back of my mind. Um, then, you know, I wasn't on a lot of fish. Really, when I went into the tournament, I thought if I catch 15, 16 pounds, I'd be do doing well. Um, but if I got lucky, I, I, you know, I could maybe catch 20 plus. Um, but I stayed in that main section, you know, just due, due to the fact of not wanting to get under those bridges and the water and all the rain that we had had. I mean, literally, I think it rained an inch that Friday night before the turn or Thursday night before the tournament on Saturday. Would you consider High Rock predominantly a shallow water fishery or an offshore fishery? A little bit of both? Like, how, how would you say it, it lays out? A little bit of both? A little bit of both. Um, so, as as June and July start getting here, um, those those uh, post spawn fish and they start getting in their summer pattern. Uh, you do not want to sleep on um, you know finding some offshore structure and throwing in twenty foot of water, fifteen twenty foot of water, dragging a worm or something. You don't want to sleep on that because you can you can catch some really nice fish doing that. Now they will stay on the bank. Uh, that's one thing I've always loved about high rock is I can catch them in a foot of water pretty much year round. Um, now catching the quality you need to have 23, 24, 25 pounds uh, year round on the banks might not be there. And that's why you want to mix in some of that offshore fishing. But, you know, high rock is definitely a place that you want to mix that in. It is interesting. Cause you look at, um, you know, the last couple of, uh, Kerr Reservoir results. It's like 17 pounds, 16, 18, maybe a 20. High Rock last year for the BFL, 21, U, 20, 20, uh, 09, 20, 03, 18, 18, 17. There's some, it's completely different. There's big weights at the top of the leaderboard compared to Kerr. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, a lot of big large mouth in, uh, in High Rock Lake. I mean, catching, you know, five to seven pound fish or four to seven pound fish it's you, you know it's pretty, fairly common um, and then you can catch the you know you can catch the unicorns there you know they're nine nine, nine pounders you know really there was yeah yes there was and so in um the the bigger weights on high rock this year your 26 28 pound bags were coming in january and february um, they were catching some big pre-spawn girls. Is that an area lake or a spot pattern lake? So the difference between like a high rock, a Lake Norman and, you know, a Smith mountain, like, like how does that lake usually set up when it comes to finding the fish? Well, do you run the whole I think place? There's a, few different th there's a few different things you can do. Um, there's some grass growing in that lake now. Um, you got to know where it's at, but there, there's some hydrilla that's in that lake. Um, I think a lot of people's figured it out because where we're putting in right now, South Moth, that pocket's plumb full of it. Um, and it started topping out last year in there, you know, so it was pretty, I mean, if you got eyes and look down, I mean, you're going to see just mats in here. And if there's one in a pocket, you know, there's other. And so if you know where some of the grass is, you can fish that pattern, especially as the summer gets here. Um, the, the lake is full of bait, um, absolutely chock full of bait. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, big swim baits, um, you know, if you're in the four facing, throwing the minnows, I know that's a player. I know the boys back in when they did the rock outdoors trail this past fall, I know those fish were getting caught that way and they were having some really big bags, 25 plus pound bags, you know, and that was every other weekend. Um, Damn. You know, um. The fish, I mean, it's a, 
it's a fun lake. I mean, you can catch them shallow. You can catch them in the dirty water. Um, you know, you, you get in the river, you can flip the bushes and not just necessarily the river. There's bushes all over the lake, crane creeks full of bushes. Um, you know, so when the water does come up, maybe you can't get under the bridges. The main lake can just be uh, a, a ton of fun with, you know, finding that water in the bushes. It's like her, those bass will relate to that, you know, those bushes. And if you're a flipper, or, you know, like winding the spinnerbait bomb, you know, you'll get bit. And usually it's going to be a, you know, three, four pound bass. You're going to catch good fish. We're eventually going to segue to Lake Norman. And I think this is a great way to do it because Lake Norman is just docks galore. And when you're looking yep. at High Rock, because it doesn't have the same amount of docks as Lake Norman, how important is it to be the first person on a section of docks? Does it matter at all? Yeah, well, Can you fish behind docks, people? Docks are a huge player as well. Like I said, just High Rock, you can fish so many different ways and catch them. Um, High Rock is one of those lakes you get on the right stretch of docks and you can catch 25 pounds and you're done in, you know, 45 minutes. Um, Damn. And uh, uh, you can also get on a section of docks and, you know, catch 11 pounds in a matter of minutes, you know. But, um, yeah, docks, a huge player. Not near as many docks, like you said, with like Lake Norman. Lake Norman chock full of docks. Um, but uh, docks are a huge player, huge player uh, on High Rock. It, it kind of sounds a little bit like the Potomac River where sometimes you just have to fish in the crowds because that's where the fish are. Is that correct? Or do you try to avoid crowds altogether? Well, me personally, I do. Um, <laughs> you brought up the Potomac and crowds. Oh, so, you know, last year I went to the regionals, right? <laughs> uh, wow, that's a different ball game. Um, as far as you better learn how to fish around people and communicate and this and that because if not you're not going to have a good tournament you're going to get spun out you're going to get ill um and that i'm glad i started going up practicing as early as i did you know yeah. um, you hooked me up with uh, mr chris johnson he was great i went run around with chris a little bit i met another guy while fishing up there todd and um, those guys, you know, just kind of took me around and with the community areas, they would be fish, you know, in those areas, but you're going to be around boats. Well, I literally on the day one of the tournament, I went into Quantico and, uh, found a ditch back there and, uh, and, uh, I, I, I we were catching them good. I mean, we were catching them on a frog, having a blast. I mean, I bet day one tournament, I probably caught 25 plus fish myself, oh, so cool. my co-angler probably caught another 15. I mean, we both had limits. Um, but when we were leaving that, 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 that afternoon, there was, there's like three docks in the back of that, or maybe it's like five docks or so in the very back. I just went cruising by them, you know, I'm, I'm a North Carolina boy of uh, grow up on Hick, you know, fish, Hick, uh, uh, Norman all the time. And uh, I said, I gotta check these docks out. And I get over this one in particular dock and there's brim everywhere. So yeah, we, I get up on the brim and I'm looking, you know, I'm a sight fisherman. I, I love looking at them. And I'm just being quiet. And, you know, me and my co angler both know we pretty much got what we got. I think I had like 11 pounds and he had maybe eight pounds, whatever. Day's almost over. We got to run back. And I see a three pounder and I see at least a six pounder, like on the bank chasing these brim. I was like, hmm, that's neat to know. So we go way in, whatever. I was like, maybe I can catch her in the morning. Maybe she's targeting those brims. She's living on this dock. I pull in there. I'm the first, but I pull in there and I get there. I remember I had like a kind of a mid boat draw, whatever, but it's like boat 68 or something like that. We run down there. I pull in, I wrapped her down. I get right on the dock. I'm quiet pulling in. I said, okay, I'm going to catch her. I'm going to catch her on top. Fired a frog up there and I'm walking the frog and I see both of them come out and she's following it. And I stopped and she just wouldn't eat it. So I put a little wacky worm out, you know, and I'm messing with her. While I'm messing with her, my co-angler that on day two now he's a pistol. He 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 was a wide open kind of dude. He uh he's in the back of the boat and I told him I said well cast under the sailboat behind us. I said I I've caught him under there and he did. He caught him a keeper under that sailboat while I'm messing with this this big fish. And uh, this boat just starts coming down the, by these docks and I hear my co-angler go, man, I ain't no way he's gonna. Because we're going as we're fishing, and I'm like, I wouldn't think so. We're raptor down, you know. This guy literally, him and his co angler, fish pull in and start casting their bait under the same damn dock we're fishing. So the guy behind me, he's a pistol. He goes, Hey, bud, 
can't you see we're at we're we're you know we're anchored up here right? we're fishing this dock he's like oh i was coming down this stretch or something and they start getting into it a little bit and i'm like hey bud just calm down you know whatever you know but they literally fished the same damn dock we were fishing Oh I never could God. get the big girl to buy it. I tried, and it, 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 it didn't work out. But, but that was pretty. Uh, that was pretty unbelievable. If you if 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 you got a thing with fishing with crowds, the Potomac's probably not the place for you. When you're dealing with crowds, that's a great segue to this. Like on Lake Norman, a really docky lake. how much space do you guys give each other? So let's say you're coming down one section of docks, and and you see somebody down there coming up the other way. Is it like a, a three dock space and then you guys like cross each? Like, how does that etiquette work? Well, I mean, for me, if I could see them, like, I'm probably not going to turn and fish and, and go towards them if I could see them. Now, of course, there's instances where they're in behind on the walkways. You don't see them, you know, and then you kind of pull in. Maybe they come out. Then I'm going to just turn around and say, my bad, I didn't see you. But as far as a distance, I mean... You know, I think a hundred yards would be, you know, if I really wanted to fish them. Me personally, I'm probably just going to pass those docks, leave. If I've got fish on them, I'm just going to hope that I'm a better, I can put my jig where you can't and I'm going to come back and fish them later. Um, so would you fish behind? If, would you start behind? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Cause like, it's interesting being a Potomac guy my whole life. Cause that's basically, that's where I live. That's what I, I'm used to. I fished a kayak tournament. That was the same weekend as Mr. Bass for Pennsylvania and Maryland. And there was like 200 boats in this one Creek and kayaks. And a lot of people got spun out. And to me, it's like, this is like I 95 traffic. This is normal. And I, I was able to like to get a top 10 out of, I think it was like 90 kayaks because I just didn't care about the crowds. The fish were here and I was yeah. going to work with it. Yeah. But I also see when I would go in college to Kerr or Murray, people are like, oh my God, you're 400 feet from me. That's too close. And it's definitely a weird learning curve. Like there's a, a weird code of conduct on the Potomac and like Ohio lakes that you don't have other places that you must understand <laughs> when you go outside <laughs> of these tidal bodies of water. Yeah. 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 I, that was something I had to learn from my end that, Hey, it's the, you know, it's okay on the Potomac. If you're, in Belmont Bay and there's yeah. 30 boats like within a hundred yard or shoot, like you said, three, 400 feet of each other. It's cool. You know, as long as I can't cast and hit your boat, we're cool. Yep. Um, and, and that was different for me. I think though, that's why guys that fish tidal are so good at Florida and Florida versus tidal, because you're used to that weird community crap where it's like this grass mat, this Creek, this is where all the fish are and we have to learn how to get along. Yeah. There's, there's not a lot of other places in the country where that's kind of the way it is. Maybe the, yeah. maybe the great lakes possibly where you have to be that way. But even then you still have more distance between you. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. Lake Norman. Um, I've never been in there before. It's a bucket list item. I've heard weird stories from different biologists that I've had on that like, well, the fishing has really gone down over the past years because the Alabama bass, the spots got in there and, and it's hard. But then you look at some weights and tournaments and the largemouth yeah. looks pretty healthy. Like how is like Norman right now? It's amazing. Uh, it's the best I've seen it. Um, it is absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the, the, the F1, there was an F1 stock in, um that happened five years ago maybe now four or five years ago that didn't get talked about a lot um and they put it, it was a bunch i don't know right off hand it was a bunch and it was a it was a big if that's got something to do with it um, i think so because uh, I mean, God knows the, the tournament pressure ain't changed at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, we literally, there's there's four to five tournaments on a Saturday and a Sunday, and then there's a Monday night or Tuesday night or Wednesday night or Thursday night. Or, I mean, it's, you know, it is. it is So the, you, the tournament pressure has not changed. If anything, it's gotten worse, but it has not hurt the 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 fishing at all. Um, the weights for the winter trail this past year, oh, my word, just – at 20 pound bags, there was a guy called a, it was a nine, six out of Lake Norman during the winter, trail, during the winter trail, several, uh, well, um, 
uh, the guys who won the cat trail this past Saturday, uh, 22 pounds had a seven and a half pounder. Um, I mean, they're still biting good. The the big weights were really coming um, December, January, February. It was, if you didn't have 20 pounds, you wouldn't in the money. It was unheard of for Lake Norman. It's, it's again, it's a testament, um, you know, for people that are listening in right now, I, I had the privilege of hosting the, the Virginia Tidal Bass, uh, basically data summit uh, for the Department of Wildlife Resources of Virginia. And they talked about, you know, Odenkirk talked about like the success that they did with their stocking program of F1s in the James River and Smith Mountain Lake. And Smith Mountain Lake, great example, it's going to take 30 pounds and probably eight years to win. I mean, it's it's getting better yeah, and yeah. better every freaking year. And to yeah. hear that about Norman is just more proof that the F1 stocking program, it will work and make a lake better, 100%. Yeah, it's got to. Well, you know, when Redcrest was here last year, um, Marty Stone, uh, they got in and the bass fishermen around here raised a ton of money. So there was a whole nother stock and that happened last, maybe it was last fall. And it was it was a lot of bass. Uh, they, they put a lot of F1s in there. So like I said, there was the we had the F1 stock in four or five years ago and then they just done it again last year. I think you're going to continue to see Lake Norman um get better and better um you know uh you know there and there's there's some grass in norman uh they have sprayed it in the past you know i think it maybe might be branching out in some more areas maybe it'll take uh, uh mr green jeans a little bit longer to find before he starts spraying but uh why um, are I they doing that that's that? helping a lot why are they spraying that stuff that makes no sense to me yeah I'm, I don't know. I, I feel I feel like it probably has to do. There's a lot of money on Lake Norman, and you know it's hard for them to swim. Mm. You know, off their uh, docks and things like that. Yeah. Is High Rock have the same outlook on the hydrilla? There are they going to try to kill it if they find it, or are they more lenient? Yeah. So far, I I think a lot more lenient. I think High Rock is it's a different lake. Um, it's a it seems to be. Norman is a lot of out of state people, um, a lot of money. High Rock, yeah, it, it's a nice lake, but it, it seems to be more country, more laid back people. Most people, that's why the dock plates can be so good on High Rock because most docks are full of brush. Everybody's a crappy fisherman or a cat fisherman on High Rock Lake. And, um, you know, I, at, as of right now, I haven't seen any spraying going on at High Rock. I mean, the grass pretty much everywhere I knew where it was at was topped out last year. Nothing got sprayed, and it's coming back right now. That's freaking awesome. That's good to hear because that's the one thing I battle here in Virginia and Maryland is educating the public about the importance of subaquatic vegetation, and it changes the fishery. It makes it 100% better. And so to hear that at least at High Rock it's semi-safe, that's fantastic because, Lord, if 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 Bugs Island, if Kerr Reservoir got a healthy population of grass, holy shit, that place would be different. So oh, much yeah. better. Yeah, I, I um, think so too. What, well, you've seen the elite guys, um, you know, talking about the hairs chain, you know, they, they went late April and just it, it was a struggle for them boys. You know, there's always the boys that's going to catch them. But, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the grass spray, and I just know from fishing the big bass down a couple of years ago, hell, we were in Lake Griffin, and we were up by the um, the, the swamp area up there, trolling motor only, and hell, we had planes coming over us, and we thought we were going to get sprayed, you know. Uh, they were just, uh, you know, dumping buckets of poison everywhere, and I mean, I don't know. If you're dumping that stuff in the lake and it's killing grass, it can't be healthy for fish. Nope, it can't. Um, and talking about dock fishing, I absolutely suck balls at dock fishing. I can't imagine the emotional wreck I'd be in when you go to Norman. And there are so many freaking docks. Like, yeah. are you just hammering down fishing these docks and after 30 years of experience and waypoints you're going to be successful as a dock fisherman there or like how does it work to begin to sit through the amount of docks that are on that lake well um i mean probably giving some juice away but i think the mlf done that when red press came so but dredge docks that's one good way to weed them out you can get on maps and you can kind of pick out which you know uh where they're at um the fish really like to set up on the dredge docks, um, finding the, you know, docks with brush and, and structure under them, 
um, that definitely helps with just running. Because, I mean, I'll tell you right now, like Norman, you can get on a string of docks and not get a bite. Um, so you, you got to fish the docks that's got some structure under them. Um, I, I, I really like shallow docks. And, and I mean, that's Lake Norman, or that's High Rock as well. Uh, um, I think a lot of times the shallow docks, you know, it's almost people think that uh, it ain't got but a foot and a half of water under it. Well, I ain't never seen a bass a foot and a half tall. <laughs> you know, if he's that tall. And that's a t shirt. So, that needs to be a t shirt. Know, uh, <laughs> so it, you know if you got if you got 18 inches of water under that dock that's more than enough room for a six pound bass to be and i think a lot of times those docks don't get hammered like you know some of the other docks and especially you know just being able to get good and, and a jigs a, is a perfect weapon to being able to skip and you know put that thing you know way up under that dock or under that pontoon you know in between the floats well you brought something interesting would you rather lake x exists would you rather have lake x with a thousand docks like lake norman but only so many docks have brush under them or would you rather have a a, a high rock where all the docks pretty much have brush under them because it feels like norman would be easier to graph around and find the key areas right yeah and it can be it really can be but uh it's the problem with norman is finding those three to four pound fish you'll find mm. a ton of you know the you know, 14 inch keepers, you know, 12 to 14 inch fish, you'll catch a ton of them, but you know, finding where the bigger fish are staying. And I know too, you know, Lake Norman, even with a ton of docks is a key player offshore. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of structure and rock piles and points and stuff that's offshore that a lot of the guys have a lot of success offshore. You'll see early in the fall, um, when the winter trail, um, happens here at Norman, um, you'll see a lot of the guys who fish offshore will do real well. And they'll do real well all the way, really. They'll do real well all from November all the way up till February when the fish really start moving because, you know, the southern end of the lake, the fish will start moving up on the banks, in, you know, last of February. Um, we'll start seeing fish coming, you know, ready to, you know, start spawning. Um, so some of the guys that fish out deep and things like that, you might see them kind of fall off as March and April come and a lot of the bank guys start doing real well. But, um, you know, you can't, you can't leave the offshore bite on Norman. Alone. I mean, those, those big spots get out there and there's a lot of five pound spots that get weighed on Norman. That is interesting. Cause it kind of ties into what you said at the beginning about, you know, people at Lake Norman and fishing Kerr they usually do well at both places. That is very fascinating to me. Interesting. Huh? Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you see that you see, um, you know, gosh, all the boys in the winter trail, you know, your Hank Cherries, your Shane LaHue, Shane Lineburgers, um, you know, Robbie Dye, David Williams. I mean, there's just so many guys, um, you know, KJ Queen. I mean, the list just goes on of the guys that's right around Lake Norman area that seem to do good all over the country. Once they, you know, once they get to where they're almost impossible to beat on Lake Norman, you send them anywhere else in the country, you know, and they start doing well there too. Is Lake Norman, would you consider like the number one lake in North Carolina, just from a public perspective of people knowing it from the Bass Masters and, and such? Yes. Yeah, it definitely is. And it's a shame because, you know, we mentioned like High Rock is the first one in the chain. There are so many other lakes that pro I don't know if you don't want them to get pressed or not. I mean, like, a, you know, a Jordan Lake, places like that. Why is it these other lakes don't get the same press coverage, you think? Is it the size? It, it must be the size. Uh, the, the Angler's Choice runs an amazing trail um, here. Um and uh, one of their events was on Jordan um, back in March. And me and my partner, it's a team trail, and we fished it. And, I mean, we actually had a ball on Jordan. Um, hell, I caught a 9-4 a there last year and didn't even get big fish. <laughs> a guy Jesus. knocked me off with like a 10-6. Yeah. Oh, my God. But, uh, That's but, uh, insane. Yeah, yeah, a lot of big fish in that lake. But, yeah, it, it, it really don't. Like falls, um, you got Lake Gaston. Um, Jordan, uh, Sharon Harris, which I heard Sharon Harris. Now, I, I've not fished Sharon Harris, um, but I've heard that they went crazy and sprayed all the grass in that lake and the fishing just went to nothing. But um, shocking. It used to be a, 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 <laughs> yeah, right. it used to be a really big fish lake as well. Um, you know, uh, 
but yeah, Norman, Norman is like that. That is the lake here in North Carolina. Um, you, you know, High Rock. You know, the, it gets fished a lot. And then you know, we got Lake Wiley, and you know, there's a lot of turn. And Lake Wiley's fishing really good. Um, I, I'm actually I'll be on Lake Wiley this weekend. Um, got the Carolina Bass um, um, tournament going on this weekend at CBC. So. Gaston's a weird one because of, you know, where it straddles on that Roanoke chain, but it doesn't get the press coverage. Is that because there's not a big marina to have big tournaments on it? Because it's yeah, 20,000 acres, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it probably has to do with the boat ramp. Um, they had a tournament. It wasn't a TBF tournament. They had a tournament um, a, a couple weekends. Well, the ABA uh, Pro League did a tournament there last weekend. And my buddy, uh, my buddy, shout out to uh, Flash Butts, Mr. Flash Butts. He he got it done. He got it done actually two weekends in a row. He won last weekend with a little over 20, I think it was. And then the weekend before that, they had a team trail there, and him and his partner won it, I want to say, with about 21. So he had a good two weeks on uh, gassing. Yeah, that that Roanoke Rapids, there's so many of those places I really want to kind of explore because they don't get they're not tournament size, especially Roanoke Rapids, but they're just neat little places that look like they'd be a lot of fun to go to um, and, and just like mess around on like, you know, Mayo Lake. Uh, they're so I mean, North Carolina has just a shit ton of lakes that are aren't necessarily like big tournament size, but fun size. Yeah, I've never fished Mayo, but last year. I was going up for Kerr to practice for an English Choice event. Didn't read the rules good, so on the way up, I was like, I better stop and make sure I can even practice on Thursday. And I read the rules, and I said, nope, you can only practice on Friday. And I said, well, hell, ain't Mayo right around here? And I looked, and I was actually close to Hako. Hmm. So I, I went and put in a Hako Lake, never been there before. And I absolutely blistered them on a spinnerbait. I caught two to three pound fish. And I bet I caught 50 of them. They they were eating the blades off a of spinnerbait. I had so much fun. I remember I went down uh, toward the, the dam on Hako, and uh, there were some fish on bed and whatnot. And uh, they were being real finicky and went biting this and that. And I decided to run up the river, and I was glad I did. I went up there and I went through a pile of spinnerbaits and just had an absolute blast. That's so cool. Like, I mean, again, as a Virginian where we have like four lakes that you can run a big engine out of and they're all spread out over our big state. When you look at North Carolina, and I think this is, again, this is the issue with with fishing tournaments. The only issue is you only fish certain lakes if that's all you do is tournaments. You're going to go to the Potomac. You're going to go to Kerr. But then in a state like yours where there are like, you know, Mayo and, and all these places like, oh, just go for fun. And like, damn, you can smoke them there. It's not just like Norman, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was surprised with Hiko. I'd love to go back again. I mean, it was April. It was April of last year. So now would be the time. If you want to go just have a ball, go to Hiko and throw a spinnerbait because <laughs> they act like they've never seen one before. We've talked about your, your, your BFL wins and your ABA wins. So far, like, what do you think of ABA going to this solo series? Because it's not drawing the 300 boat mega fields. Do you think it's been successful? So far, yes, um, I really do. Um, uh, first tournament uh, was on Norman, and uh, uh, you know we had 80, 80 some odd boats came out, which was amazing because uh, ABAs in the past when it was the Open Series, we were lucky to have thirty boats. Um, so that was amazing to see. Um, I think I finished twenty second in that tournament, um, and then we had another Norman uh, tournament. Uh, when was that? I think that. Uh, that was a, like the third week of March, and uh, I actually got on a really good. We had we had about sixty eight boat turnout. Some boats didn't show up um, for that one, but still a great turnout compared to the past ABA events. And uh, I run down the lake at Ramsey Creek and was going to fish some spawners, and there was a high school tournament that was going out of Ramsey Creek. So there was about five hundred boats, and I didn't stay in there long. I think I caught about three fish. Um, I came out of Ramsey, I ran toward Davidson, and I pulled up on some stuff that I hadn't fished in a long time, and I caught a four-pound largemouth, backed it up with like a two-and-a-half-pound spot, then I ran across uh, ran across the creek there to another spot. I caught a uh, like a three-and-three-quarter-pound spot, and I said, okay, this it's getting good, and I ran all the way back into Davidson, and my motor started making a weird noise, and uh, 
I kind of caught my ear and I was paying a little attention to it. And then I just went on to this one spot I wanted to fish and I pulled in and I caught one about almost three pounds. So I was setting up, I knew I had maybe 15 pounds. And I was like, I, mean, I got a shot to win this thing. And I hadn't been up in the river much. So I said, I'm going to go run up in the river and I'm going to flip everything I know where I could catch a big fish. I still had four hours to fish. Well, I'm coming out of Davidson Creek and that noise kept getting a little louder and a little louder. And then all of a sudden it went away. And I said, okay, oh, we're good. Must have been something in the prop. And about the time I thought that, pow, lower unit out, done. So here I am sitting in uh, the mouth of Davidson Creek, you know, and, and if you've ever been to Norman, right there where Davidson comes into the main channel, it's giant, you know, and I'm out there floating. There's pleasure boaters everywhere. And I'm like, what in the world do I do? I got a good bag of fish. There's no way I'm getting on the trolling motor and making it back to Pinnacle. Called a tournament director. He says, we got two options. He says, if you know somebody in the tournament, they can come. You can put your, your fish in the boat, go weigh them in, or you can have anybody you want tow you back. So I'm sitting there floating around. I called a couple guys that I knew in the tournament, and they're like, well, we're way up the river, man. We're on some fish, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. I called Towboat USA. This is going to be their little their little spiel right here because they – Hey, I called. Uh, I, I got on my phone. I called them. There was a. They were out of Cornelius. They uh, talked to the guys. They you said you get me back to the ramp by two forty-five. That's when I got away in. Or and uh, they were like, "Yeah, it'll be close. We'll see." You know, we we're pretty sure we can get you there. Well, within about twenty-five minutes, they had a guy. We were hooked up to my boat. And off we go. You know, and I told him I was like, "Well, I got a pretty good bag. I think I might can make a check in this event with this bag." And he said, well, I'm going to put it in the wind. So he he gets this going. Well, God, two hours later, it's like 2.30, right? It's the longest tow of my life. And I, I'm kicking, watching the clock, you know. I'm like, God, am I going to make it back? Because this tow bill is probably going to be four or $500. You know, I'd like to at least win that back, you know. And we we make it back at 2.40. And uh, – and I, I couldn't have been more thankful for the guy with the tow boat, you know. And sure enough, we get in there, and I get I get the last place check. I won four hundred bucks, and the tow bill was five hundred. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it it worked out for me, you know, and it really helped in the points a little bit. So I, you know, it was a it, it was a good, our second our second ABA Pro League event. It was a it was a doozy, but uh, it worked out for me. So um, dude, yeah, that's great turnout there. And then we had. The last, uh, our last tournament was on High Rock there a couple of weeks ago, and you know, uh, almost smashed twenty pounds, nineteen seventy five, I think I had, and uh, got beat out of the wind by a friend of mine, Mister Austin Garland. He he got it done with I think twenty oh three, so he got me by a few ounces. But um, the turnout kind of dropped down a little bit on that. We had forty some odd boats, I think, but the payouts were still great. I mean, the payouts have been phenomenal since the first. I mean, when we had eighty boats. I think Mike Stevens won that event. I think he got almost five thousand dollars. Plus, he got Skeeter money. Um, um, you know, I don't know what he walked away with total, but I mean, even to the last event here on High Rock, where we only had forty some odd boats, um, I think Austin won thirty eight hundred bucks. I got fifteen hundred for second, uh, and it paid all the way out to top eight and eighth place. Still got four hundred dollars. You know, so. Um, you know, you don't have a co-angler. You know, it's a solo event, so it's just you. And uh, I, I, I'm really liking the format. I'm liking where it's going. Our next event's going to be the two-day. It's June 8th and 9th, and it's going to be on Kerr for two days. And I really like June, uh, end of May and the first of June on Kerr. So hopefully I can go up there and really, really get on them. And uh, I'm sitting in fourth in the AOI standing. So, you know, go up there and get it done for the two-day event and, uh, might might have a pretty successful year in ABA, but uh, so far, I like I said, really really like the format, really like how it's set up, and I really like how they're running the trail and love the payouts. How do you like your uh, your electronic setup this year? What do you think about electronics now that you you have another year under your belt? Electronics. So as far as like what I'm running, what are you running, and what are your feelings about from the use that you've had? Not just from, not social media, but just your opinion with what you've yeah. seen. Well, so I, I run, I run um, the Garmin. I got Garmin LiveScope. 
um, with the LVS 32. I don't even have the newest transducer, the 34 or whatever, or the big off uh, offshore 54 or whatever it is. Uh, I'm running just a basic 32. And I, I've got 360, um, you know, and then I love my mapping. And I think we talked about that before. I'm a huge map guy. I love Lake Master. Um, that's how I catch the majority of my fish. Um, I'm a shallow water guy. I love shallow water. Um, has live scope been a player for me and some of my success? Yes. Um, being able to see, you know, that you're not in a dead zone, you know, you're in a Creek and there's actually fish below you. There's bait balls. There's, you know, you've got fish chasing bait. You can see activity. It gives you more confidence to stay in that area. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's huge. Um, um, I, I like my 360. Uh, I like being able to see around the boat. I like being able to see structure when you're going down the bank. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, hell, out here to the middle of the lake is a huge rock pile and things like that. Um, I know it's uh, this forward facing sonar has just went nuts, especially, I guess, this year. I mean, for it to be around, how, how long? Four, four years, five years now? I think it's 2000 and. 10 was the first generation and then it's only been like four or five years that all three manufacturers have had their version of it okay um, and i think it's interesting to ask you this because you know guys if you want i'll put a link to the episode we did last year you haven't been fishing as long as maybe a guy that's done it in high school and college and done it for 30 yeah. years with a big bass boat you're kind of newish to this so you got hopped into okay. this trend the zeitgeist of all this like what two years ago three years ago Exactly. It, yeah, it's been right. You know, right. At, well, you know, I started fishing with Lee about five years ago, but I was we were still just looking at uh, a down image and a side image. And then is what he had on his bass cap. And then when he upgraded to Lake Master was like a game changer for me, because now I seen the topo of the lake and, uh, and being a big deer hunter and all. And we talked about that in the last episode. That just was huge for me. Um, but it wasn't until I bought that Skeeter in 22 um that you know that live scope and all that was just com like i said completely new to me because i haven't been in the game that long and uh has it been a player and have i learned it and and really researched it yes you know um um for for somebody that's out there um you know trying to make a living doing it you you better learn how to use it and you, you know better get good with it because it seems like you know the newer generation of guys they're coming in and they're catching them, you know, and I'm even seeing it here on the local level. I mean, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of guys winning. It's new names, newer names that I've never really seen. And it's younger guys, you know, it's the, the you know, the younger generation in their twenties, you know, um, and they're doing really good with it. Um, as far, I don't know. I feel like they need to limit something. I guess my opinion, I mean, if NASCAR didn't limit NASCAR, them boys would be running 400 mile an hour on that track right now. Like they had to come to a spot to be like, okay, you, we got to stop at some point. It's getting out of hand. You know, I think uh, Hank Parker said in that one episode of his, is they got the golf ball that it don't matter who hits the damn thing. It's going to go 30% further than a normal golf ball. Like, there's so much technology that like, I think completely banning it, I, I think would be ridiculous, but you know, maybe putting some, you know, some um, restrictions on it um, of how much, you know, you look at Taku's boat. <laughs> oh, my God. He's got like a 22-inch screen. And he's, you know, it's just what they, I think Zaldane in his uh, little podcast video, he said he had like $50,000 worth of electronics. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think at some point maybe some limits to it. But I, I don't know if you, you know, it needs to be completely banned or if it does – do the tournament trail like what just happened down on uh, you know um lake lanier yeah that's true i i'm actually it'll be interesting to see how that whole format does in one year two year three year time because where does corporate america put their money like it's you have the trail now people want to do it now you got to show up and support it so don't complain on social media go fish those specific well, see, trails and, and and I think it, you know, I think they were expecting a 200 boat turnout. And you seen him, those 40 some odd boats showed up, you know. Um, so I feel that way. You know, I'm a lot with you right there, Thomas. Like, if you're going to get on social media and you're going to be the keyboard warrior and you're going to, you know, 
and you know, Mr. Randy, where were you at? I didn't see your name yeah. on the list down there fishing, you know, and you're like the number one guy that wants to, you know, throw mm -hmm. stones in the glass house. But, you know, you got to support it if you, if, if you're going to bitch about it. I a hundred percent agree with you, boss. Like again, I do. I think there need to be limitations at, at some point. Yeah. Because it shouldn't cost $300,000 to get something. Um, but it is here to stay. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. We're not going to go back to just the stone age. So this, yeah. it's just, you got to learn it. And again, it's just a tool and it really does. If you understand that it's not just that you're going to see every fish ca like bite your bait, but it's breaking down information and you can make decisions quicker. It yeah. helps you make decisions quicker. And, and that, agree. yeah, a hundred percent. Um, Travis, we've covered so much today. I really can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Do you have anything major coming up? Do you have any sponsors you'd like to promote? Well, um, major coming up, really my main focus is our two day event, um, our ABA pro league event and June 8th on Kerr. So I'm going to put some time in there. Um, really would like to do well, but, um, other than that, I'm just cherry picking, fishing some team stuff around here. Um, uh, big shout out to Custom Tackle Supply. I've always got to show them boys my love. Uh, they really take care of me. Uh, they make an awesome jig, muffin top jigs. Check it out. Um, it's where a lot of my success come from. If you're a jig fisherman, they make a great jig. It's got a great keeper on it. It's got a big solid hook, and it'll put them four to five pounders. You can boat flip them. Boat flip them. You don't have to worry about a net. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's about all I got going on. But it's good to seeing you again, Thomas. Travis, it is always an absolute honor to have you on. You have an open door policy. Anytime you'd like to come on the show, you're more than welcome. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. If you'd like, you can also check us out on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And if you'd like, become a Patreon member as we continue towards our goal of starting a nonprofit to help out our local waterways. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.